analog to digital conversion. I spent quite a bit of my life on that. And today I want to talk about oversampling and Sigma Delta ADCs. But <clears throat> before we get into that, <clears throat> I think it's good to understand why we have different ADCs, what are the key performance figures, and sort of how do some of them work? How do you make something that's really, really good? And then I want to introduce oversampling and Sigma Delta modulators, and we'll have a look at a few examples. And I want to sort of point out that analog to digital converters are one of the few things within circuit design where you can spend your life you can actually do analog to digital converters for the rest of your life if you wanted to. It is a very, very complex topic. Back in 99, there was a guy called uh, Robert Walden, and uh, I think his name was Robert, and he did a survey of the analog to digital converters at that time and made a nice plot, and that's what we're looking at right now. In that plot, there are a few sort of, um, call it limits. One is thermal noise. We can see that sort of as we increase the speed on the x-axis, then thermal noise will place limits on how many bits we can get out, how many effective bits. And we can see the calculation of effective bits down below. So we have the signal to noise ratio minus 1.76 divided by 6.02. We'll see later why it's that equation. Also in this graph, we have Heisenberg, because there's an, uh, a certainty principle that relates to energy and time, and you can sort of, based on some rough mathematics, you can set a kind of Heisenberg limit. That limit, all those sort of type of limits like this, you have to take with a grain of salt, because you, you have to check what the assumptions were in the paper. But there's a general trend that as you make ADCs faster, they will have a less number of bits. And that's sort of a general trend. These days, there's a guy called uh, Boris Mirman, who I think is a professor in Hawaii somewhere. He used to be at Stanford. And he also sort of updates this performance survey of ADCs every year. You can find the link in the slide set. And we have a similar kind of plot. We have plotted the figure of merit from Walden as a function of the sampling speed. And also here, there are very few ADCs that are sort of below the, uh, well, 10 femtojoules uh, is pretty good, but below one is really extremely good. I think on my PhD, I got one picojoule per step. <laughs> but that that is a few years ago, though. So there are sort of these key, for po key performance metrics of an ADC, and, and some of them are the sampling speed, the, or m not necessarily the sampling speed, but also the bandwidth, the effective bandwidth of the ADC, the power consumption, how much power you can consume, and the number of bits that you can effectively use. How many useful bits? I wanted to also just let you know that students at NTNU, where I teach this course, some of the students, some of the people at NTNU have made some of the best ADCs in the world, and and actually there's a quite a long tradition for making really really good ADCs. In included in the links here, I have two of them. So you can sort of see that uh, in this figure merit plot, how they place according to the best in the, at, in the world at that time. And they're still decent. I want to go a bit more into detail on these ADCs, particularly the first one here. I know that one very well, because that's what I did for my postdoc. So <clears throat> how do you make a state-of-the-art analog to digital converter? Well... <clears throat> The key point is you have to be able to publish it in one of the key journals or the key uh, conferences. There are really only a handful of conferences 
within integrated circuits for ADCs. It's the uh, solid state circuit conferences. And getting a special issue version of the conference paper in Journal of Solid State is sort of, that's pretty good. So back in 2014, I started my postdoc. I did that for about three years. And at the end, I finally was able to publish in the Journal of Solid State. And this was the ADC I put in. Now, in order to get into a sort of tier one journal, you have to have some new things. There has to be something very interesting that, that the reviewers say, oh, that's cool. This we want to show others. One of the things in there, well, it can be the circuit. How do you make the analog to digital converter? What you're looking at right now, and let me go a bit full screen, is the actual ADC. On the left side, we can see the differential input voltage. So the diff differential input voltage is sampled on top of a set of capacitors. So these are binary scaled capacitors from 2 to the power of 8 times the unit size down to 1 times the unit size. There is a comparator that is able to de detect whether the voltage on the top plate of the capacitors is larger or smaller than zero. And then there's a bunch of these logic cells or, or spit cycling logic cells. These kind of ADCs are what we call Nyquist ADCs. They can operate up to, have an input signal up to half the sampling frequency. And this particular ADC has really one circuit trick, and that is that uh, the self-time loop that is given by these logic cells, sort of you first, you sample the input signal. Once this input signal is sampled, you start the comparator. You check whether the, um, the um, top plate is larger or smaller than zero. That will kick off a change in voltage on the bottom plates of the capacitors over here on the left side which adds or subtracts half the reference voltage from the top plate. And then you make another decision. And sort of going through each of these logics, you end up sort of uh, doing a binary search, which is how the SAR works. The settling time of the change in voltage is quite important. So it's important that you settle fully the sort of charge transfer that happens before you check the value with the comparator. And that delay will vary based on the inverters driving that uh, these digital signals that you can see here. So it depends on the reference voltage and it depends on the size of the capacitors. So the trick I th did in this circuit is that <laughs> basically the bottom plate of the capacitor feeds into the generation of the clock for the comparator. And as such, as you scale the reference voltage as the capacitors change, then the delay is automatically adjusted. So that's kind of that's a circuit trick that I believed was new, and I still think it is new in that paper. But that's necessary not necessarily enough. Because a trick like that, you can prove that you can sort of show that in simulation but nobody will believe you. What you actually have to do is you have to tape it out. You have to make your circuit, you have to make the layout, you have to send it to a foundry, and you have to get the chip back. What you're looking at right now is the layout of the chip I made back then. And here you can see the ADCs are these uh, nine, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine ADCs. The first three ones, I believe those were 10 bit. And then you have a 10 bit where I sort of uh, disregarded all common sense when it comes to DRC rules, design rule checks to make it small. Then a couple of 11 bit converters. Then I had my nine bit converter and an eight bit converter, and also a nine bit converter that was made with IO transistors. In the end, when measuring, turn out that it was the nine bit converters both the one made with core, core transistors and the IO version, that was really the best performing, and that's what I published. 
You can see also, in addition to the ADCs, you have to make all the stuff around, like clock logic, all the registers control, the ADCs, selecting which uh, ADC is tested and so on. So there's quite a lot of work that goes into proving a concept, a simple, no, well, yeah, a pretty simple circuit technique using the bottom plate of the capacitor. So the ADC itself, you can see a bit more detail here. On the right side, you have the 22 nanometer, so not 22 nanometer, 28 nanometer FDSOI. This was uh, SD technologies. You can see the logics, the SAR logic, and the comparator on the right side. You can see the comparator is connected to the top plate of the CDAC. So this is the capacitor's capacitive DAC. And it's not that easy to see, but here are all the, I guess it's 512 capacitors that make up the binary weighted CDAC. At the bottom, you have the bootstrap switch. On the left side is the one that is made with IO transistors. So in any given state of the art design that you want to publish in the tier one journals, it's not enough to have a single thing that is new. You have to have multiple things. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that if I only had that circuit technique, that wouldn't have been enough. But <clears throat> once you get the chip back, you measure, and here you can see the input signal is close to Nyquist frequency. Here I'm running at 20 megahertz, and then at one megahertz, and you can see the figure of merit. And it's pretty good. When we compare it to the other sort of state-of-the-art designs at the time, like Peter Harper's design or some of the others, we can see that it's the same order of magnitude, around 2.7 femtojoules per step. So that in itself, I don't think that would have been enough to get this paper in. So there had to be something else. There had to be some one more thing or a few more things. So what made it, I think, the difference when it came to the reviewers and the difference in terms of this paper is the fact that my ADC was compiled. So before we move on to explaining what that is, compiled, if we compare to the compiled version uh, from Weaver, we're talking a 300 times improvement in figure of merit, down to a figure of merit that is similar to state of the art. So what's what's this compiled thing? Well, basically it is a, it was at the time a new way of thinking about how to make an ADC. Because when we make analog circuits, you will discover that you have to do the schematic and you have to do the layout. As soon as you do the layout, then you sort of locked into a certain technology, be it Sky 130 technology. If you then want to transfer that ADC over to GF180 nanometer or into 22 nanometer from global foundries, you're basically starting the design all again and you have to do the layout full from scratch. Now that takes time. So what I did was <laughs> I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to make a ADC multiple times. So I spent a lot of effort of building a compiler that can take a netlist and a something I call the object definition file and a, and a rule file in order to generate the ADC and made sure I only used one transistor. And that's what you're looking at right now. So a very, very simply defined transistor where the transistor was defined by um, an ASCII file, basically. Now, building a design with this technology or this methodology is not necessarily easy. You can see an example here, you have the SPICE netlist that gives you the uh, NMOS transistors and the PMOS transistors. This is actually part of the SAR logic shown earlier on. And then there is a JSON object that shows you how this should be routed up. So for example, for the number one here, let's see, we can recognize one um, is marked here. So it shows, okay, routing metal one from the nodes called N1 and N2 and routes in sort of a <laughs> vertical manner. Uh, this follows actually a notation that is quite similar to ticks for those that know that. So, spent a lot of effort building up the ADC and the SpiceNet list and this JSON file and this technology file. 
and then use a compiler that I wrote to turn it into a schematic and layout. So the first design takes more time. And I also discovered that not many people were able to do this. It's not that common that you find a combination of a programmer and an analog designer. So I, that's not that many people I know that have been able to use this effectively. But for me, it worked really well. And I've also ported this ADC over to Skywater 130. So you can actually access, you can go to the GitHub. <clears throat> and let me show you that. Let's go um, here. Let's see. A bit slow today. Right. So here is the GitHub repo. You can download that. You can open it up. Uh, and in that CIC folder, you will find this uh, JSON file that defines how to how to sort of route things and how to build up the structures, kind of like object-oriented design with polymorphism and sort of concepts uh, taken from software programming. Anyway, that's one way to do it. And then it's a good also good way to build on other people's work. So the trick about being at an institution like NTNU is that you have people here like me, like uh, others that have done this before and you can leverage what we've done. So what you're looking at right now is one of my students PhD students that did a noise shaped version of a SAR. So here you can see the loop filters, which you don't, maybe don't know what is yet, but noise shaping is the keyword here. So it's using a trick, I'll talk more later on on this, to sort of improve the performance of the successive approximation ADC. And this one is actually using a couple of tricks. So, <clears throat> Once we move from sort of low resolution, maybe up to, let's say, 10 bits, pretty easy. Um, 12 bits, slightly harder. 14 bit, mm, pretty starts to get difficult. 16 bit, hard for Nyquist ADCs, unless they run really, really slowly. <laughs> but when we move into sort of the 20 bits and the higher resolutions, then pretty much all of them are using some form of ore sampling and noise shaping. So that's the topic for today. When we move into those high-end ADCs, then it's also common to switch to a different figure of merit because it turns out the Walden figure of merit, it makes an assumption that you can increase the power by two times when you add a bit. However, that's not true if your ADC is limited by thermal noise. For If your ADC is limited by thermal noise, then you have to increase the power four times for every single bit. Now, in this Schreier figure of merit, that's the one that's quite often used for high-resolution uh, ADCs. So, let's start with quantization. Somehow, we have to take our continuous time continuous value analog signal and turn it into a discrete time, discrete value signal. Quite often, if you've encountered quantization before, it's sort of thought about like a adding a noise. You have your input signal, X of N, you add a noise source, and maybe it's even white noise, random noise, and then you get your quantized signal. So what do we mean by that? Well, it looks like, kind of like this. So imagine we have our continuous value, continuous time signal, the blue one here. And then we can create from that with switch cap circuits, for example, a sample and hold, we can create a continuous value discrete time signal. So we sample the analog signal at certain points in time. Now, now it's still kind of analog, it's just discrete time. But in order to turn it into a digital signal, we have to map it on to a range of values. So for example, I can change it a bit now. So the green here now is the um, continuous value sampled analog signal. 
And if I want to map it onto the values shown on the y-axis here, then I sort of have to pick the nearest one. So if I do my ADC correctly, maybe for this green signal here, I'll pick the value here. Let's call that, let's say, 1, 2, or maybe 0, 1, 2, 3. Yeah, so then I pick the value 3. And the next sample I take, the green one, I figure out which integer value is closest to that. So that's, I guess, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So now I have 3, I have 5. Now, I have quantized my analog signal. So instead of saying whatever the voltage was on the blue one, I now have 3 and 5. But that means I've made an error. There is a difference between my quantized signal and the real analog signal, and that's what's shown below here. Now that quantization noise will always be, be between plus minus a least significant bit. So in this case, it'll be half the range between two values. So the actual mapping onto the uh, quantized axis, we also need a reference for that, right? So we need to define what voltage is actually a 3 and a 5. So that's always part of an analog to digital converter. But you end up with this noise, this quantization noise, that is inherent in your quantized signal. So yes, we can think of it as a process where we take an analog input signal, we add a noise, and then we have our quantized signal. Continue, sorry, discrete time, discrete value signal. In most books, in most lectures, in most discussions, you will hear people say, the quantization noise is white. It's a random variable. You can consider it white. It's a linear pretty thing. I'm here to tell you that's a complete lie. It's not <laughs> white noise. It is not a complete random signal. So you can sort of look at this and, and maybe you can work it out. I'm not able to work it out. But luckily, there are people that love mathematics. And there was a guy called Blackman back in the day that wrote a paper on the the sort of properties of quantization noise. What is quantization noise? So he's derived sort of uh, based on some proof, mathematical proof, that the quantization noise is an infinite sum of harmonics of the input. So the P here is the harmonic index. And the important part is the following. When we have an even harmonic, then it's zero. So that means the quantization noise is an infinite sum of odd harmonics. Now the amplitude of the quantization noise is given by this top function here. And there is a, for the first harmonic, there's sort of a 1a here, a delta. And then there's a sum of <laughs> um, Bessel functions. So I'm not a mathematician, but I have know a few mathematicians and sort of signal processing people, and they, they tell me that Bessel functions usually turn up when you solve some integrals. <laughs> and that's not the important part. We don't have to derive this equation. What I want to show you comes here. Oh, by the way, uh, we can also make an assumption on the amplitude, and then you can simplify the equation a little bit. And let's look at this one. So still, we have the quantization noise is an infinite sum of harmonics of the input signal with a certain amplitude, where the amplitude is given by the function that we see here. The most interesting part is the Bessel functions. So here we are talking about a sum of Bessel functions of the first kind, where the harmonic index gives us the different Bessel functions. Also, there is a relationship to the number of uh, bits that sort of go into the Bessel functions. Now, Bessel functions look something like this. I think these are the right ones. So we're summing these Bessel functions from 0 to infinity, or from m like 1, m equals 1 to infinity. It's natural then to think, okay, if the Bessel functions has some oscillatory nature, 
that means that maybe the amplitude has some sort of oscillatory nature. So we should be able to recognize in a quantized plot these sort of harmonics. But if we just look at this as a white noise process, you can actually figure out that the the average value of the quantization noise is zero. And that shouldn't come as a big surprise because we can look at this as a thing here. So if we take the integral from time zero to time infinity, or we can assume that, or uh, integer number of periods, then the sinusoid that starts in zero and <laughs> it goes a period. And if you integrate that for an integer number of periods, the average value is zero. That makes sense. Now the RMS power, that turns out that it can be approximated by the size of the LSB divided uh, squared divided by 12. Now with these two, we can compute a signal to noise and quantization or signal to quantization noise ratio. So we know the, the amplitude or the um, power of a sinusoid is given by the amplitude squared divided by two. And we can divide that by the quantization noise power and take 10 log of that, simplify blah, 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 blah. And then we can get to the quite common equation that gives you the SQNR of 6.02 times the number of bits plus 1.76. Now you can notice also that the 1.76 part here, that is actually this 10 log 6 fourth. And that comes from the fact that we're using the, uh, the signal power of a sinusoid. So if you use a different type of input signal, then the signal to quantization noise ratio will be slightly different. I like to look at what actually happens in a program. Now I cannot show you a continuous time, continuous value signal on a computer generated by a computer. That's impossible. Every computer is a discrete time, discrete value system, but I can emulate continuous time, continuous value to whatever position I want if I have enough bits. So what I'm trying to show here is the frequency spectrum of a single sinusoid. Now I say it's a single sinusoid and I mean that even though there are two spikes here. And that's because this is a complex FFT. It shows both positive and negative frequencies. So the integer values here are not actually any relation to the frequency, it's just the number of samples in the FFT. But you should know from Euler's identities that sinusoid can be written as an exponential uh, sum of, what is it, e to the power of ix, is it plus or minus? <laughs> e to the power of minus ix divided by 2i, something like that. So, two sinusoids. Assume that this left side, complete left side, is a continuous time, continuous value. The first thing, the first thing, first thing we do is transfer it into the discrete time domain. When we transfer it into discrete time, we saw last time that you're actually folding in noise. So whatever noise you have will fold within the band. So we can see that the quantization noise actually, uh, so the the noise level increases. It's not actually quantization noise yet, it's just folding the sampled noise into the band. Now comes the quantization. Now we're using a rounding function and we're quantizing it to a one bit. And what should be quite obvious from the rightmost plot is that the quantization noise, all these different harmonics, that's not white. It's not a flat spectrum. These are harmonics of our input signals. It's actually an infinite sum of harmonics where all of them have folded. So the, the ones at high frequency above a sample rate sort of fold into our band. Now what happens when you, you increase the number of bits is that that sort of visualization of quantization noise kind of disappears. It's not that, it's not that easy to see here when I'm using 10 bits that there is very little quantization, or that the um, quantization noise is not white. I guess if you squint, you can say that, oh, uh, then maybe this looks looks like a harmonic, but it, ideally it looks quite similar to the other plots. And, and that's sort of the trick with um, quantization. When you have, I 
guess, more than six, seven bits, it looks quite white. But for one bit, <laughs> one bit quantization, it is not white. And it's not white at 10 bit either. And it is important because it becomes very important for what we we'll discuss later when it comes to noise shaping. But before we get to noise shaping, there is something you can do actually after you quantized to improve the signal to quantization noise ratio. So I could just take a Nyquist converter, for example, sample at a giga sample, and then maybe I'm only interested in the signal up to 10 megahertz. I can then compute what my signal to quantization noise ratio would be if I sort of put in a filter, removing a lot of the condensation noise at high frequencies, because I'm only interested in low frequencies part. In the book, you can go through the derivation and also in the lecture notes. But basically, when you oversample, you're adding a roughly half a bit per doubling of the oversampling ratio. So for example, if I sample twice as fast as the bandwidth I need, then I can get one a half bit extra. If I sample four times as fast, I can get a bit extra. Now in the frequency remain, we can have a look at that too, but just sort of how would you implement oversampling? It is really easy when it comes to doing that in digital. You have your Nyquist converter, you have your digital output values. That's sort of what's coming into this oversample function. I just say how many, how many, um, what's my oversampling ratio? In this case, I generally generate the length of the vector, initialize the output using loops in Python, which is a, tr a terrible idea because loops are slow in Python, but I like to write dumb code because dumb code is easy to understand. We can also always make it faster. So for every single value, every single index in the input, we sum the OSR next samples. So that's what this loop does. So for zero to OSR, that's the K, we generate an index for the value to add to the output. So for example, for zero here now, we'll take the current value and we'll set YN to the current value. For K equals one, we'll take one after the current value and we'll put that on top of Y. So by doing this, we're sort of placing a window sum on our input we're summing the OSR next samples. That is actually the same as a filter, it's like an averaging filter. So we, if we have an OSR two, sort of adding two values to each other, that becomes a filter. And it has a zero at uh, half the sampling frequency. So we can see how we go from continuous time, continuous value, discrete time, continuous value, discrete time, discrete time, and then we filter it and uh, we sort of improve the noise. And we can, we can go to higher oversampling ratio and we can see another notch in the spectrum. This is quite often called a sync filter, but that's not the important part. The important part is that there's quite limited number of times we can do this if our input signal is quite large, so large in frequency. Because as soon as I go to higher OSR now, then it will start to filter my input frequency and that's not what we want. So there are limits to how much you can improve, improve performance by oversampling. There's also an extremely important point if you're actually making a Nyquist, Nyquist converter and you want to be able to oversample the output. For example, on many, well, on the NRF52, I know that a little bit since I worked on the ADC in that, there we can oversample. We can sort of take N of the or 1024 um, samples of the output and we can sum them together. The only way you can do that is if the digital output actually changes. So it's important to have enough noise such that your digital output code changes. Because if your digital output code doesn't change, there is no way you can improve the performance. So for example, if I'm sampling something and I always get 100, I get 100 now, I get 100 next, <laughs> tomorrow, I get 100 next year, 
then I cannot improve the resolution. However, if there's enough thermal noise to sort of ditter around a few LSBs, so for example, I get 100, I get 101, I get 99, and so on, then I can compute an average and improve my resolution. It's natural to think, is there a better way? Is there something I can do going from my continuous time continuous value to my discrete time discrete value signal that sort of helps me with the quantization noise? And that's where we get into noise shaping. So we do something <laughs> with before we get to the, the quantizer. I like to think about it like this. It's a, it's a feedback network. Imagine, I, I, I don't know if I've shown this graph before, but anyway, imagine I have a system where I have an input voltage and I have an output voltage and I have this H of S, this filter. And I take the uh, difference between the output and my input and generate an error signal, Vx. I can work out the equations and then we can look at the bottom equation here. We can see that if I make this H of S infinite, then I can exactly make my output equal to my input. And the reason for that is if there's any deviation between the output and the input, then there will be a VX error signal. Now that is an infinite gain, so that will change the output. <laughs> so this type of feedback systems is exactly the same as we use in our op amp, where we have a high DC gain to be able to force the two differential inputs to be the same. Now, this is sort of the beginning for a sigma delta or a noise shaping ADC. It is leveraging the principle of negative feedback. Let me change the picture a bit in order to do introduce a quantizer, the EDC, and a digital to analog converter. And you should realize that it's kind of the same picture here and here, here and here. We have the input, we have our voltage output, and we have our error signal. Now, I can compute the same type of transfer function. Let's do that later, but just sort of intuitively. If I make my output voltage here a exact representation of my digital value. So I take my digital value by three, <laughs> for example, and I the DAC produces that uh, perfectly into a voltage that is equivalent to a three. And then my input is also three. Then my VX signal will be zero. And then no matter how much gain I have here, then my digital output voltage doesn't change. However, should, the, should there be a slight error between my output voltage from the DAC and my input signal, then there will be a small error. And if I have a very large gain in the H of S, then my input to the quantizer will change. And this might go in sort of a, a, since my ADC and my DAC are discrete time units, it will sort of happen at a certain cadence. So you can make noise shaping systems like you're looking at right now, both with discrete time at the input here, like switch cap based uh, sigma delta, or you can make it as continuous time. That doesn't really matter. Uh, but it's actually important to be able to control the input and make the error small enough, fast enough, if you're doing continuous time. But it's sort of the same principle. Another sort of intuitive fact you can look at this on is, if I make my H of S really big, then it doesn't really matter how many bits I have in my ADC, because if in, with an infinite gain in H of S, then, well, my ADC is going to change value and the digital output here is going to change value. So the av what we're looking at is actually the average value of the digital output. I could even go all the way to one bit quantizer, one bit ADC, as long as I have enough gain in my loop filter, which is uh, what we call this the part. So sigma delta 
modulators are a way of leveraging negative feedback. We quite often draw a linear version. This is sort of a discrete time version. I've sort of mixed up uh, Z domain and sample domain here, but uh, let's forget about that. If we take the input signal, the U of N, we take our output signal, Y of N, and we feed that back and generate the error signal. We put the error signal through a loop filter, and we get an X of N, we add our quantization noise, and then we get back to the the quantized Y of N. So Y of N is a digital signal. It could be actually be a one-bit digital signal. If we look at the, um, I guess, the is it called a transfer function in the sample domain? I'm not sure. But if we look at Y of N, what that actually is, it's the error signal plus a impulse response and, and the convolution with the signal that is y of n minus h of n. So the convolution of the um, impulse response of the h of, n, uh, h of z here. We can also do that in the z domain, where the convolution just turns into a multiplication. So the question in these type of structures could be, given my input, how does my output look? And how is the transfer function from my noise to my output? And that's what we usually talk about when it comes to sigma delta modulators. It is the signal transfer function and it's a noise transfer function. But it's very important to remember that in these type of structures, we are actually making the assumption that the E of N, the quantization noise, is white. That's one of the fundamental assumptions to make these type of systems work. The DAC has to be linear and the ADC has to be an addition of white noise, even though it's not. <laughs> In order to get the uh, signal transfer function, what we can do is we can just set the, uh, the quantization noise equal to zero and then compute in the Z domain what the uh, signal transfer function will be. And we get this function here, one divided by one plus one over H. And from that, you can easily see that if you make H really, really large or infinite, then the signal transfer function is one. Now we're not able to make H extremely large for all frequencies. We usually have to select which frequencies we ha make as close to infinite as we can. For the noise, we can also compute that, and here we see an interesting point. So the noise transfer function from the noise to the output is actually slightly different because it is one divided by one plus h. Now, if I make h infinite, then I'll have no noise. There is no noise. There's no quantization noise. <laughs> so again, I can't make h of, h of z infinite everywhere, but where I make it really large, there will not be any quantization noise. And it's independent to a certain extent from the quantizer itself, the ADC. As long as these sort of assumption noise, uh, assumptions are made, like the um, quantization noise is uncorrelated to the signal and the um, mean value is zero. As long as those type of Sorry, uh, the uh, most important, it's uncorrelated. That's where you get sort of the key assumption and you need to have a linear deck. Okay. We, for the complete system, our output, we have the signal transfer function times the input and the noise transfer function times the quantization noise. Now, we can have a look at what we call first order noise shaping. So putting in a filter, this is an integrator, we can compute the signal transfer function. In the signal transfer function case, it's it's just a delay. We get the same as the input, just delayed. But the noise transfer function, that looks different. Now, I, I, I'm not able to see from one minus z to the power of minus one, how that looks. <laughs> but luckily, again, we have mathematicians and they really like this kind of stuff. So in the book, there is a derivation of how you get to figuring out what's the absolute value of the noise transfer function. And it works like this. So we take the Z and we insert the, uh, um, set dom uh, sorry, <laughs> the S domain version. We set S just equal to the J omega. We don't care about the transient response. And then we get this value. 
we can insert that into the noise transfer function, and then we can just rearrange it, do some mumbo jumbo, and we can prove that this is actually a sinusoid, pi f divided by fs times a factor. And I guess here the important part is, if you take the absolute value of this thing, it's just um, the first here, two times. So absolute value of this j, that's just two. Absolute value of e to the sum phase, that is also just um, one. So this function, you can put that into a calculator and you can see how the noise transfer function behaves. So, <clears throat> yeah. Oh, did I go too far? Sorry. Now we can continue, and we can do the same thing as we did with quantization noise. We can insert for the power for the sinusoid, and now the power for the noise. So in that case, we have to, to have to band limit our noise consideration. So if we're looking at the noise from a frequency to a frequency, and then compute the power of this thing, we can actually prove that the SQNR for a first order sigma delta is 6.02 times the number of bits plus 1.76, minus 5.17, plus 30 log the OSR. And here we have the improvement of a pure oversampling. If we look at all the different SQNRs and ENOBs, so ENOB is just the uh, inverse as used by Walden, SQNR minus 1.76 divided by 6.02, we can look at sort of the Nyquist ADC, that's just that equation. Then we have oversampling, which adds 10 log, the oversampling ratio. We have first order sigma delta, adds 30 log OSR. S second order, 50 log OSR. Now, this is why noise shaping converters or sigma delta modulators are so extremely useful. One of the challenging things with making a really high number of... Um, bit ADC and DAC for that matter, is it's really hard to make them linear. It's really hard to make an ultra precise difference between the values that is precise to a 16 bit, for example. It's really hard to make resistors match to the 16 bit level. However, a one bit ADC, it's only two points, same with the one bit DAC. As long as that is time invariance, the values of the ADC and the DAC, so it means the reference doesn't change over time, then it's actually linear, because it's only two points. Now, we, with a one-bit ADC and oversampling, it doesn't really make sense. If you oversample 1,024 times, you'd only get six bits. If I do it with a first-order sigma delta, I get 15 bits. And I, if I do it with a second-order sigma delta, I can actually get close to 24 bits. So, noise shaping is a fantastic way to make high resolution ADCs. It is an incredibly fun way of making a circuit, but it's not that easy. <laughs> it's not that, um, it's mathematically complex, it is circuit complex, you have to care about linearity, offset, and, and this, it's quite difficult. So you can actually spend your life on making sigma delta modulators. I wanted to run through a couple of examples because I, yeah, this is fun. Let's make one in Python. That's sort of the, the simplest I can show you. <laughs> Where the input, the u, is discrete time, continuous value. So here we have already sampled our signal. And then I run through the uh, each one of the indexes in the input signal and I compute my first order sigma delta. So I take the quantus, oh, this is the um, error signal. So I take the previous error signal and I take my current input value. I subtract the previous output value. So there is no DAC here, but I'm working in Python. So the reference value for the U of N and the feedback of the digital signal is the same. Basically, it's a DAC where the reference voltage is 1. And then I have a quantizer, which is taking my X of N, so my error signal. I'm multiplying that by the number of bits I have, 
and I'm adding uh, some random numbers. Oh, you'll show, you'll see why uh, pretty soon. Actually, quite large random numbers. One fourth the input scale of my quantizer divided by the two to the power bits again. So my y, sd are integers, while my u and my x are floating point numbers analog. So let's look at what happens. We have our uh, u. We may, oh, actually this is the u because this is the discrete time version. Here I'm just showing for reference a quantizer. If we put the u directly into one bit quantizer, how the spectrum will look. And on the right side here, you'll see how the spectrum actually looks when I have this is the output from the sigma delta modulator. This my this is my y, sort of the one bit uh, integer. If I have a one bit deck, a one bit quantizer. And we can see the difference between so just the pure Nyquist ADC, one bit ADC, and our noise shaping ADC. There is less quantization noise close to zero frequency. We've shaped it. <laughs> it sort of tends towards infinitely small. But there's still all these spikes. You see that? All these spikes. And those are our quantization noise harmonics. This is why it's important that <laughs> quantization noise is not white. If you have a one-bit quantizer, the quantization noise is not white. But we can add noise. We can add ditter. That's why there is this ditter thing here. I'm adding a random noise variable. That could be thermal noise, if you have enough thermal noise, or you physically insert a pseudo-random signal into the quantizer. Because when you do that, you whiten the quantization noise. Yes, you add a little bit of noise to the signal, but you remove these harmonics. You decorrelate between the input signal and the quantization noise, which makes the assumption about this uh, sort of H of S and, and the whole sigma delta actually work. And you can see that the zero, so the smallest value here, and that also increases because now we're, we're closer to an ideal sigma delta. So, Python example. Uh, you can see in the lecture notes where you find the code for that. It's quite often in papers to show sigma delta modulators using a logarithmic x-axis. So here you can see the normalized frequency. So that goes to fs half. And we can see our input signal. And then you can see sort of this constant slope in the log plot of our first order sigma delta. So that means from the power spectral density plot, which you're looking at right now, you can actually identify quite a lot about the sigma delta modulators. I wanted to show a few more examples. And let's start with something I did on my PhD. This is a purely th theoretical work. It was published in, in Transactions on Circuits and Systems, TCAS1. And the concept here was actually something called uh, open loop sigma delta modulators. It is basically a local control concept where you locally control the voltage swing in a switch cap integrators and then you can show that that is actually equivalent to a integration, but a modulo integration, and you don't need to have feedback from the output of the quantizer back to the loop filter. Look in the paper, it's quite fun. In that, I made a model of a, this is, I believe it's a fifth order. Yeah, it's a fifth order uh, noise shaping filter. And you can see there, there's a zero at uh, zero frequency. And then there is a couple of complex conjugate zeros at a higher frequency. And the, the key point about complex conjugate zeros is that allows you to shape the noise transfer function such that you can use a lower oversampling ratio. The disadvantage is that the quantization noise outside your band of interest, so above this green line, that increases. So it's quite easy to, or it becomes harder to make them stable because the out of band quantization noise is quite high. I had a student uh, a few years ago that also worked on sigma delta modulators. This is actually a combination of a successive approximation ADC with a sigma delta modulator. So in a binary search as SAR ADC, the value on the capacitor at the end of the bit cycling is actually the quantization error, assuming linearity is perfect. So that means you can take that analog signal, you can feed it into a loop filter, 
and then use it in the next cycle uh, of next bit cycling. In addition to that, in this ADC, he also added in a nice little trick where he uses that sigma delta modulator, the fact that you have a very high resolution uh, sigma delta modulator, to calibrate the size difference between the biggest capacitors and the smallest capacitors, because that's one of the main sources of nonlinearity in a SAR ADC. The loop filter that he used, that's also a switch cap thing. It looks something like this, and here we can also see the noise transfer function. And that's also, uh, this has a complex conjugate zero, and it also has some poles at high frequency. So a switch cap system with chopping of the input off op amp, because the offset of the input op amp was quite important. Very interesting paper. I think this was the one, this was the one actually where the reviewers initially didn't believe it <laughs> because the performance was too good. But it's really cool, and then all this was measured on the chip. This was the one I showed at the beginning of the lecture. I currently have a student that's working on an even more advanced type of. It's not really a sigma delta modulator. It's more a superset of uh, noise shaped ADCs that if you're given the right state, collapses to a sigma delta modulator. So it's something called control bounded ADCs. And there's multiple people working on it, but my student is working on sort of actually, yeah, making something. It's a cool concept because it, it just assumes that we have our input signal, and then we have some sort of um, loop filter but local control. So this may be an integrator or something. So we have the output of the first stage uh, and we're checking that and we're feeding it back a control loop. Now it's making the assumption that based on the control signals, the S's, we can actually infer, I think it's using a form of Bayesian statistics actually, we can infer what the input mu signal must have been. So this type of noise shaped ADC is not actually using a decimation filter or a filter of the output is using an estimation filter to estimate what the input had to be. It's cool. Uh, the maths is a bit too advanced for me, but <laughs> it's really cool. And we can see the noise shaping also in this type of structure. We see sort of the first order here, and we so this is sort of a, I guess this would be third order. We have a zero in the noise transfer function at zero frequency, and we have a well, we have a zero complex conjugate zero here around, uh, I guess this is seven, eight megahertz or something. And now we're getting to the even more advanced. So the previous one was complicated and uh, quite tricky mathematics. At least I feel that. <laughs> but you can also make complex ADCs. So notice how I said complex conjugate zeros in the noise transfer function. You don't have to make complex conjugate zeros, but you have to make complex conjugate zeros if you have a real system. Now it's possible to make a complex ADC if you have two real paths, which is what is shown here. Quite often in radios, this will be readily available because quite often we have what's called complex mixers where we shift the frequency from 2.4 gigahertz down to a lower frequency or down to zero for that matter. And we do that with a 2.4 gigahertz uh, signal and a 2.4 gigahertz signal that is shifted 90 degrees. This is easy to do with clocks. But that's equivalent to a Hilbert transform. So that's sort of the combination of the in-phase and the quadrature phase, so these two signals are 90 degrees offset. With those two, you can actually make complex zeros in the noise transfer function that only appear on one side of the spectrum. And that's what you're looking at on the uh, spectrum plot here. So we can see that the complex zeros in the noise transfer function only appear at positive frequencies. And then this is really at a huge advantage in radio systems, because in radio systems, you have what's called an image reduction problem, especially if you're using an intermediate frequencies that is larger than zero where both, for example, if I have a signal at uh, 2.4 gigahertz, I want to, or 2.401, I want to turn into a one megahertz signal, then I multiply with 2.400. And that sort of shifts my one megahertz signal down to one megahertz. 
but I also have a 2.399. There might be a sig signal at uh, 2.399 gigahertz, and that will shift down to minus one. And in these type of complex sigma delta modulators, you can actually reject that immediately. And that's really cool. You can sort of place your STF around signal transfer function, around where you're actually interested in the signal. But then you have to have two real paths. We can see the active RC filters here. We can see the ADC, the first quantizers. This feedback from the quantizers back to the inputs. So that's our first uh, local uh, sigma delta modulator. And then there's a second stage. This is sort of a, a multiple stage sigma delta modulator. Way back when, when I first started working, this, what you're looking at now, is the first real, uh, maybe it's the first real circuit I made, actually. Real as in, in a volume product. It's a very simple, it was made to be a very simple battery monitor. And it's a sigma delta modulator. <laughs> so here we have a voltage at the input. The voltage turns into a current because we are using the op amp to force the VX to be able to be able uh, be the same as VRF divided by two. So the input current here is VN, VN minus VRF divided by two divided by R. So that's the in current that we integrate on top of the capacitor. So integration in this case will lead the output voltage to go up and down. And depending on the voltage level, we use a comparator sort of to sort of switch it around and integrate the other way. So by switching in the reference signal. And then we're using a clock comparator to give us a digital output. The comparator and the counter, sorry, the counter, yeah, let's forget about that. The D output, that's our digital output, that's our one bit digital output. That value will be either high or low. If I count how many ones I get, that is actually proportional to the voltage at the input. So if my, if my input signal is low, for example, then I only have zeros. Because then my input signal, the current flowing in from the input is exactly matching my reference current. This offset resistor, that's just to shift the common mode. That's not that important. The way this works is actually in what's called an incremental mode. So you start this out by resetting the capacitor you reset the charge on the capacitor, and you, then you run it for a number of cycles, maybe 1024. And in that case, the counter actually becomes your decimation filter. It is basically an average over 1024 samples. So this, the full thing is actually a Nyquist converter. <laughs> so the uh, digital output, the um, Nyquist sample rate kind of at the output here is the clock rate divided by well, the frequency of the clock divided by the number of samples that you take. So, sigma delta modulators, very cool. You can dig down, you can really study it, and you will not be able to understand it from this one lecture alone. All I can hope is that you've been introduced to a few concepts, maybe some of them you find interesting, and you start learning on your own. So, thanks for listening to the lecture today. Have a fantastic day. Oh, and uh, like and subscribe and all that stuff. <laughs>